Uh, all right. So today we're going to talk about emails, phishing emails, and how we as security teams can identify these emails and analyze them, inspect them, and find malicious parts. So first of all, why do we talk about emails at all? Uh, it seems very basic, right? But emails are all over the place. Uh, organization use them, individuals use them, we all use them. And many organizations reported experiencing phishing attacks. And a phishing email is a lure, is a lure that uh, meant to look like a legitimate email and we're victims to open, interact with the email and that's how they infect them or steal information. Now, when we talk about phishing emails, it's not only uh, the obvious one with a malicious say, URL or the, the prince that asks for money. Phishing, and this is how MITRE attack uh, actually classifies it. It's a way for threat actors to get an initial access to the victim. It's a way to deliver threats. It could be backdoors, information stealers, Trojan horses, and so on. That's the first stage of an attack. And only to, to present how many attacks use phishing emails, that's only the recent uh, threats that our research team was able to find. All of these campaigns, all of these, uh, some of them are undetected malware at all. It all started from a phishing email that was, uh, maybe it was targeted, it targeted Ukraine, like with the elephant framework case. And other cases are more uh, global, like uh, targeting a sector, an energy sector. But in the bottom line, many attacks start from a phishing email that is meant to lure the victim into clicking a link, opening an attachment, interacting in some way. And that's how uh, an attack will start. And this is our, the, these are the main ways in which threat actors would use an email because, well, it's a relatively simple format in that way that it can contain text and it contain attachments. So that's what the threat actors would use. They would use uh, URLs. They maybe will try to hide them or they use attachments in uh, which they will hide the malware and deliver it to the endpoint to the victim. And our goal in this webinar is to learn how to look at emails, is to understand how we can identify suspicious parts or more malicious parts. And I really, I do understand that some of you might say uh, that a well-configured security tools should be able to stop these emails from arriving to the endpoint, arriving to the victim. And you're right, and they should. But based on these attacks that we saw, and the amount of uh, malicious image, uh, malicious emails that are being sent, it's still very important. It still emphasizes how important it is to understand the email format and to understand how exactly threat actors use emails to deliver threats. For these cases, when the security tools miss the detection of these emails, uh, when we need to investigate these emails, so maybe in some cases the tools uh, were successful, but still it's up to the investigators to understand what is going in the email itself. So that's what we're going to do in this webinar. So first of all, email has a header and a body, like many other formats. Uh, the header will have different fields that we will go over. And the body is actually the, the part that you see in your mailbox, uh, the content, the URLs and the attachments. And an email, um, this is how it would look like when you don't look at it in a, a Gmail or Outlook. This is actual uh, an EML format and it's really readable. You can open it in a text editor. So we see different fields, we see lots of information and it can be a bit overwhelming, but you will get used to it. So the from and the to are the, the fields that you're going to see in your email uh, inbox that's basically the address from which the email was sent to sent from and sent to and here we see the the name 
in this case, the, the receiver of the email is reducted. And it's very common for uh, files, for email files that are submitted with virus also to have a uh, reducted uh, field. But that's usually how it would look like. Uh, next, we have to receive. The received field is basically your friend because unlike the to and the from fields, uh, which can be spoofed, the received file is like, think about it, a, a normal physical mail that goes over these different post offices uh, where each post office is a server and it adds a stamp. Uh, for a server, the stamp is its address, its IP address. Um, and that's why you see so many received fields. Uh, when an email is sent, it goes over different servers. But for us as invest investigators, these fields, what they mean is we know the path that the, that the email was uh, passed through. And when we read an email, we will read it from the bottom to the top because it's like an onion, it's like an env envelope. So the last, the, the, the inner part, the top, uh, like the bottom part of the receive, this is the first server that actually sent the email. And we can investigate, we can inspect these IP addresses and learn uh, a lot about the email. So we're going to see that in, uh, in the examples uh, in this webinar. And besides that, we have more fields like the SPF, uh, which is a DNS record that specifies which servers are allowed to send emails on behalf of our domain. So for example, uh, not any server can send emails on behalf of integer.com. Uh, and if an email fails this uh, SPF check, uh, so it may be uh, a, strong, uh, a strong indicator that the email is spoofed. All right. So what is a spoofed email? Spoofed email, it means that the threat actors are using an email address uh, that need to, the attempt to look, to make the email look legitimate. So instead of using some uh, weird Gmail address as a sender address, they prefer to use a legitimate looking email address that will convince me as a user to open the email and uh, maybe click on links, right? Because if I get an email from Amazon, I'm more likely to click on it than if I see an email from some random at Gmail. And there are different red flags that can be raised when we see um, when we see an email. So first of all, uh, there is a type of squashing, which is not really spoofing, it's just making as instead of Microsoft, Microsoft and Swan. You're probably familiar with that. But for spoofing, it's really it looks the same. And it's relatively easy to, to spoof an email. So what I did, uh, basically different free tools that allow you to send emails. Um, so here I said that I want to, to send an email from the name Elliot at this uh, not very suspicious, apparently, uh, email address. And here is, um, here is the victim. I can set the subject, I even can add uh, files and attachments and set the text. And then I created a temporary email uh, mailbox. And here you can see that if I get the email, that's what I see. I see this uh, not suspicious uh, email address and this name. While obviously this email was not sent from this address or by this user. So that's in a very, uh, simplify way how spoofed emails are working and why just looking at mailbox it's hard to detect that this this is a malicious email right so that's why it's so important to go over the headers go over the email itself dive deeper into it and understand what is going on under the hood so let's take an example to business. So uh, let's take an example uh, of this email. 
And what we're going to do is look at the from. Now, when we look at emails, the from and to basically say from we, uh, means like who sent the email. If I think that this is a suspicious or phishing email, it can help me understand who is the possible threat actor behind the email. And the tool field tells me who is the potential victim. So here, what I understand from uh, these two fields is that the email targets uh, some organization in Ukraine, and the email wants to appear like it was sent from some uh, government agency in Ukraine. And what we will do is check the SPF records for this domain. And it means to see if this domain, um, that, the, that the, the email was sent from this IP, as I said, because we're looking at the bottom part of the received field. So the email was sent from this IP, which meant to look like it was from this address. And what I want to understand is, first of all, is this domain has an SPF record? I want to understand which uh, servers are allowed to send emails on behalf, of, on behalf of this server. And maybe it is this IP and then we're good. And maybe it's not. So we're going to use a free tool uh, for SPF record check. And what we see here is that when we enter the record, the, the, the domain, there are no SPF records means that this domain, any, any server can send the emails from on behalf of this uh, server. And that's a very bad practice for organizations and especially for government entities to not have uh, defined servers uh, that are allowed to send emails because that's why any server possibly can send uh, email. And the next thing that we're going to do is to use the IP that we signed the email in the received field and check uh, the who is records. And what we see here is that the, the server is located in Turkey. And it's very suspicious because if this email was sent from a Ukrainian government entity, why would it be sent from a server located in Turkey? Now, this email uh, that we just looked at was used in the Elephant Framework attack which we were able to, uh, to discover. And this whole framework was discovered as part of a big uh, campaign against Ukraine and against uh, companies in Ukraine. And we were able to discover the whole thing just by looking at the email and the attachments. So that's how important it is to analyze phishing emails. Now, conversation hijacking is another very common way for threat actors to make their emails look legitimate. Because in the end, it all comes down to that. They need to convince me to open an email, to click on things, to interact with the email. And one of the ways to do that is to use uh, addresses that I trust or to use email uh, threads that will look like I was part of it or it was part of my organization to convince me to interact with the email. So conversation hij hijacking is basically when threat actors use stolen uh, emails from previous attacks and would use the content or even the addresses to make these emails look more, conven uh, more convincing. And what you see here is an email that was received uh, from an exchange server from a local one based on the IP. And you can see here that it's uh, a Microsoft Exchange uh, server. And this email was part of another uh, attack, uh, an updated version of ICE ID. And our research team believes that it was part of an attack that ex uh, exploited exchange servers that were vulnerable certain vulnerability and that's how they got these emails and use them to deliver the updated version of ISAID. Another uh, example of conversation hijacking is with Emotet. So uh, Palo Alto 
Unifor Do were able to find these emails and these emails. Now, what is very special about this is that, as you can see, they passed the SPF uh, record check. Now, what uh, Emotet uh, did, they based the, the threat actor behind Emotet, they stole emails and their headers, and they used the headers to, uh, to craft new emails and deliver the threat. And by using trusted headers, they were able to bypass the SPF checks. So that's an example when, even if we do have a well-configured uh, email service and a listener and so on, there are still ways that threat actor use to bypass these measures. And eventually these emails can reach the victim. And I'm sure that not every user will check the, the email the header and, uh, and try to identify each email if it's phishing or not. It's, it's impossible. So it's very important for us as security teams to, to get familiar with all the techniques. Uh, another example. So we talked about threat actors using URLs and attachments. So this is an example of uh, how URLs are used. URLs can be used uh, in a plain text or a shortened version like we see here. Uh, they can be hidden behind links or words. Uh, or images and so on. What we can see here is part of a campaign to target uh, entities in Georgia. And this email, this URL looks like it points to an address of, of the government to download a certain form. And the thing is that it is downloading a form, but it's an RTF form which will download additional payload. Uh, which will execute an infostealer called outdate. So once again, that's something that we don't straight uh, see in the email. And the thing about these URLs is that they have a very short life. They usually go offline very, qu very quick. Um, and when we see URLs, what we want to do is inspect them. We can use different commands, different tools, uh, now, I'm not from sales team, I'm a researcher, so I'm uh, talking about the tools that I'm using. So one of the tools that I'm using is our own URL analysis tool uh, from Intezer. And what I like about it is that I can see the, the malicious part. I can see st strictly the, the classification and I can see a screenshot of the, of the page. So I'm not using any sandboxes to view the information. And for example, in this case, uh, in the URL, I can see that it's going to be like an Amazon uh, signing page for Japan, I guess. And I can see more information in the indicators. Um, so you can scan a URL and get uh, very quickly some kind of full image about the URL. And emails can have different sorts of attachments different types of attachments. Uh, there are really endless possibilities. But uh, from the scans that I ran from the statistic that I was able to find, I saw that most of the emails will have uh, Microsoft Office files just because it's a very popular format that uh, is used all over the organizations, internally and externally. And usually it's going to be a bit less suspicious, especially for users that are not familiar with all the ways the threat doctors uh, would use these files. Uh, then, of course, we have the PDFs because, first of all, PDFs by default can have uh, JavaScript and execute code. And second, because PDFs use PDF readers and really lots of PDF readers and many of them are vulnerable. So threat actors, especially if they have uh, some sort of intel about the PDF reader that is being used in the organization, uh, they can use, uh, they can send a PDF that is specially crafted and um, that's how they would deliver malware. A zip and archive files are usually very common as well because, um, well, they can be encrypted if they're password protected. Uh, the content of the archive is encrypted and it usually will bypass uh, very basic tools uh, 
that would not be able to identify the malicious parts of, of these files. ESO and IMG disk images are especially um, preferable, I would say, uh, because especially after Windows 8, if you double click an ESO file, it will automatically execute uh, whatever is in the file uh, without asking. So once again, for users that are not familiar with the, with the format, it's very convenient from the threat actor perspective to use these files. And I linked some uh, tools. You're going to have the slides, so don't worry about that. But uh, I linked some open source tools that can be used to extract um, the, the attachments from the emails. And once you have the attachment, you can inspect it on yourself or using a sandbox, a virtual machine, and so on. But uh, once again, that's how important it is to, to, to inspect these attached files. All right, so another example of an email. All right, so what we're going to see here is once again, we, we usually start, I would say, uh, I would rephrase. I usually start from looking at the from uh, to understand what is going on in the email. And as in the first example, I think uh, the, the receiver is reducted, but I still have the, the potential the sender of this email, uh, which is this company over here. And if we run a quick search, we'll find out that that's a Korean uh, company, uh, some kind of a manufacturer company. And what we were able to find from this email uh, is an attachment. So we have this email that looks like it was sent from a Korean company to I don't know who. Uh, so I don't have much at this point, right? So I can give up, but I will not. I will take the attachment. And in this case, I would use Intezer Analyze just to understand what is going in this file. So except URL analysis, we also have uh, a file analysis. Basically, we support lots of file formats and we provide a genetic analysis of the file. So we compare the file to all the other files that we have in our database. But not only that, is that we take each binary file, we break it into smaller parts, we call them genes, and we have a huge database with all the genes, both of trusted and malicious uh, files. And that's how we are able to classify and identify files uh, just like uh, this analysis. And we provide more than that. We provide also IOCs, strings, and especially uh, how to detect these threats behind them in your organization. So in this case, once again, back to the emails, uh, we have this ESO file, which is a form book, uh, an information stealer, um, that was delivered by this email. So while maybe I wasn't able to find lots of information from the header, from inspecting the, the IP or the, or the domain that sent it, I still have the attachment uh, where I can get more information and understand that I'm facing a threat. So if I'm a CISO at organization or incident responder, I can understand the full picture uh, just by scanning the file and understanding what I'm facing and uh, maybe how to detect it and how to respond to it. And now it's uh, time for questions. Awesome, nice job, Nicole. Um, I see we got, we got a ton of questions. Um, someone, uh, I think it was on the slide with the uh, file, we were talking about the different file types. Um, someone wanted just to clarify, is it, you mean DMG files or is it IMG files? Uh, I meant um, IMG. But yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see what else. Um, okay, this was about the uh, email headers. So when analyzing email headers, sometimes you face an extremely edited header, so it looks like a local email. What can I do to find out the actual origin so that I could contact a cert to report the incident? So usually you would need to you would need to uh, to check the received fit because uh, really that's the that's the most uh, trustful field 
uh, which is uh, not probably not going to be spoofed. But once again, um, there are ways to manipulate uh, headers. So I would start from there. Cool. Next question. Uh, does the entire domain with the subdomain included need to be used for SPF check or is just the domain enough? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure about the specific of the subdomain. In the end, it's a DNS record. So uh, I, I guess it depends like on how you identify, identify. And then another one, could you uh, elaborate on how to analyze conversation hijacking headers again? Do you just look at the SPF headers to analyze? And is using local hosts in the SPF headers a frequent way of utilizing conversation hijacking? So um, as, as I said, in the example of uh, Emotet using the conversation hijacking, uh, so it will be hard to identify it because the SPF uh, passed. Uh, in general, to identify it, I would, you, I would try to, first of all, look at the received fields. Uh, as in our example uh, of the ICE ID campaign, we noticed the, the private, uh, uh, sorry, the local IP address. So that raised our suspicions. And then when we looked at, uh, at the fields and we tried to identify which kind of mail, mail server it is, so we identified it as an exchange server, and try to look it up and see what we can get. So we did find that some uh, some exchange servers are vulnerable, and some report mentioned that the threat actor get access to these servers and stole some information. So that's how we uh, concluded that it might be relevant and might be connected. So there is no specific field. It's more like the overall picture, like in the last example. It's the field from the form. It's the attachment. It's like building a picture from all these pieces of data. Cool. Another question. Uh, if I want to analyze an attachment, do I really need the attachment file or a hash of the attachment is enough to check? A hash would be enough. Uh, if, you, if, for example, the file is on virus total, because in the end, to to analyze it, uh, if we're talking, about, for example, in Intezor Analyze, we need to have the, the binary, we need to have the file, uh, whether it's script, a document, or whatever, uh, because usually you need to have the data. Um, so even if you have the hash and uh, you can get somehow the file itself, so it's a... Okay, another one, uh, if our users receive such uh, conversation hijacking, does it mean our email server is compromised? Uh, not necessarily, because uh, they can, they, it's possible that the conversation hijacking was from another uh, company or another organization. They're just using these emails to target your organization. Another one, do emails need to be manually analyzed or can the email traffic be routed and automatically analyzed? Yeah, so uh, there are tools like uh, uh, Cortex or and other tools that basically listen to your mailbox and uh, set the policies to what to do with certain emails that answer certain rules. So definitely you don't need to make it a manual job. Uh, personally, I would like, automating as much as possible because uh, we don't want to waste your time right so that's the goal to automate and uh most emails we get are using pass-through addresses from google docs sharepoint and such is there a quick way to identify this uh it's a real issue uh yeah i can agree i would say a url scanner uh, just a way to, to make sure uh, to understand what is what it leads to before you click it. So yeah, a URL scanner or maybe use a sandbox or a VM to to open it, and that that's what I would suggest. Uh, how about a BEC scenario where the other party has had their email compromised? Are you doing analysis on the content or tone of the email? 
Yes, so there are ways, I, I didn't talk about it, like the tone and or the language. Um, you, you should do that too. Hope this answer the question. And then someone asked, uh, please repeat the tools, the automated email content analyzer. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Um, are they looking for the, the tools mentioned? The open source tools for uh, extracting the attachments, is that it? It might be, yeah, the automated email content. I will share the slides, so, um, and if not, so uh, the person who asked it, I can link it on the chat. Cool. Um, I think someone said you mentioned like URL scan, for example. Yeah, uh, and we do use a uh, URL scan in our, in our URL scan, so, uh, but it's like a really good tool. Nice. A lot of questions coming in, which is nice. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll definitely show the slides after this um, and also the recording for you guys. Uh, the next question, uh, are there any forensic tools that you recommend to analyze emails? Um, to be honest, I, I, I tried to find something, but I just gave up, I did manually because as part of my job, um, I, sometimes I look at emails, sometimes I look at binaries. So, I just do it manually. I open it in, uh, as you saw, in VS Code and look through the, through the fields. And if I have links or attachments, I would use uh, integer analyze and uh, yeah, that, that's for the most part. Uh, if I have an email thread, how do I run the analysis if I don't have the original email? If you don't have the email, but like, if you don't have the email, but you have the attachment, uh, if you have the email thread, mm -hmm. how do I run the analysis if I don't have the original email? Um, interesting question. I guess you still have the headers. I mean, from your email box, you should be able to see the, the full content. Uh, so extract as much as information as you can from there. Uh, once again, if you don't have the file, it, it will be hard. Uh, Cool. I think someone asked a question in the beginning. I want to get back to that um, before we forget it. Um, did we go over the when analyzing the email headers? I think we did that one, right? Sometimes you're faced with an extremely edited header, so it looks like a local email. Yeah. Do that one, okay. Um, okay, I think this one, someone put it up uh, around slide 14. Uh, if our user received such emails, uh, of these hijacked, does this mean our email server is compromised? Uh, that might have been yeah, we have talking about the conversation hijacking. We got that one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone asked, just want to know what is the endpoint protection that has a good detection in phishing emails and maybe the rules to detect them using SIM and so on? Um, uh, so that's not my main focus. So I really. Uh, don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. Uh, personally, and like a company, we're more focused on the on the attachment part and the URL scanning. So uh, I, I can say from this perspective. And then someone asked, with BEC, we use a machine learning uh, AI anti phishing system. It's pretty good, but no software is perfect, and uh, some malicious. Uh, Stuff does come through every now and then. Okay, it's so not really a question, but interesting. <laughs> but it's a yeah, <laughs> good statement. Yeah. Let me see. And uh, just so everyone knows, if we miss a question, we we have all this uh, documented, so we definitely can uh, follow up with, with you guys after, or feel free to send us an email. We'll also send you an email uh, if we if we didn't answer any of your questions. I just want to make sure. Or contact we... on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, just a few more we'll get to, and then I think we can uh, wrap up. Um, so this is kind of like this person said, like it's a this is very manual, kind of what you uh, showed. Like, how would you like automate it, basically? Yes. So as I said, in the end, the goal is to automate as as much as possible, uh, just to to save us time, right? We all have so many tasks to work. Uh, I, I would suggest to, to use a tool that listens to your mailbox and maybe 
uh, will extract the attachments in the URLs or all the artifacts, and then just take all the information and use a sandbox or uh, something like Interzeralize to just drop it and inspect this artifact. So we will not be going over all the emails from the phishing mailbox uh, manually. So you can automate this part. And kind of a uh, follow up to that, um, like how does Intezer kind of fit in with this in terms of like, you know, building a email phishing pipeline? Uh, we do have integration with different phishing mailboxes uh, and, and services. So instead of doing the manual process of submitting files or URLs, you can integrate them. So the process will be like a whole pipeline. And in the end, what you will have to do is just go over maybe the uh, the true alerts that are really malicious or phishing email. And uh, the goal is just to exactly know what you're facing with without having to look at the header and all the processes we need. Although you still need to know how to do that. Nothing is perfect. Oh, another question, how can I use uh, X headers during an analysis? For example, uh, X authenticated sender. Yes, so the X headers are basically a way of the format to, stay, to say that um, you can add more headers uh, to specify different, uh, different settings. So there are really different headers over there. Uh, you can use this information to maybe look for more emails or look for maybe hunt for similar emails in your environment, if that answers the question. Oh, another one, how could we check if uh, DKIM or DMARC were spoofed or not? Um, well, in the end, it's a, it, it's a record. Uh, like in the emoted sample, it was relatively hard uh, to detect it because the headers were stolen. So you need to rely on other fields or other techniques uh, to do that. Cool, I think we pretty much covered the questions. We, we definitely did miss some. Uh, so we'll definitely try and get back to everybody. Uh, can you point us to trusted links to download extracting tools? Um, is, I guess that's what's in the slides. Yes. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, again, everyone, we're going to share the slides after this. So we'll probably send you a follow-up email today or tomorrow. We'll also include the recording that'll be on YouTube. Um, so hopefully you have all the info that you need. Um, I'm just trying to see if we can get a few more in. I'm definitely going to miss some. I got that one. Oh, if I've received a phishing email, like how do I detect it on other endpoints? Uh, so a phishing email like um, like binary files and with the attachments in URLs, you have lots of artifacts. And what you can do is extract these artifacts, especially if you have the attachment, for example, because these files usually have lots of mm -hmm. uh, detection. Of. So you can extract all the information and maybe build something like C a Sigma rule or Yara rule to uh, scan your organization and points and uh, identify it. So it, it would be especially easy if uh, there is a binary file attached because uh, these usually have lots of different uh, identifiers, but uh, that's the main uh, way to do that, to extract the information from the fields that we covered, from the URLs and use that uh, to, to scan your endpoints. Cool. And let's uh, let's wrap up with this question because I think it, it ties in nicely. So someone was asking, uh, where do I find your guys' content, uh, like blogs and such, uh, on email analysis? So I guess I can answer that one. Uh, Interzer.com slash blog. Uh, Nicole's done. Uh, she's done a few pieces of content on it, uh, including a blog on basically what she discussed today. Uh, so I know sometimes people prefer video format. Other people prefer, uh, prefer like blogs. So it's there. Um, and Nicole's also done, I think now what, you've done a webinar and a blog each on uh, how to analyze PDF files and also Office uh, docs. So definitely uh, recommend checking them out. Um, and someone said, can we upload EML files to your analyzer? 
So uh, we're not supporting e EML files as, as is right now, uh, but if you uh, submit uh, the attachment, uh, whatever it's a binary, a script, a document, whatever, uh, we will be able to analyze it and uh, give you the, uh, the report, uh, or if it has URL, so you can submit it. Cool. Uh, Nicole, do you have like the last slide we can put up just quickly with our info? Uh, cool. So thanks everyone. Like really appreciate all the great comments uh, and questions. Um, and thanks Nicole, obviously for presenting all this. Sure. It's really interesting. Um, Thank you for attending. <laughs> uh, if you guys do want to contact us, you probably want to contact her, not me, but um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, Nicole's on Twitter. Um, and then I just wanted to add a quick thing. Like, I think a lot of you probably already use our free version of Intezer where you can analyze files. Um, but we did talk a little bit about URL analysis uh, that is available in the enterprise version of Intezer. Um, but if you want, um, if you have a free account or create a free account, you can uh, request a free 14 day trial and you basically get access to all the enterprise features, uh, including the URL analysis. So if you want to kind of see, how that works and give it a try without having to to talk to anyone you definitely can do that uh cool so um i guess we'll wrap it up but uh again we'll, we'll send up the uh send out after this an email with the recording the slide deck um if we didn't answer your question feel free to contact us um but we can also we have everything documented we'll try and uh, reach out i know some of the questions were anonymous so uh, again feel free to to contact us all right, cool. Have a good have a good day, everybody.